than most people have gotten signed in by now. So, hi, I'm Aaron Walker from the National Collaborative Foundation. I would like to welcome all of you to our first um, meeting of our 2021 virtual meeting series, which we have 21 meetings planned. So the only registration link that was available so far was the meeting you're attending now, but soon, um, probably a couple of weeks to a month in advance of each meeting, you'll see a new registration link. So we really appreciate you all being here. As of my last uh, view, there were um, over 100 participants tonight, of which 83 are primary attendees, people with uh, Fabry disease mostly and a few um, family members. So that's a, a great success. And as this becomes a wildly uh, popular, we'll even get more. So we look forward to that. But I'm your poster child for uh, today's talk by Dr. Jeffries. As I recently, uh, four, and a, almost, four and a half, almost five months ago, I had a tra heart transplant. So I was in heart failure, progressive heart failure, and uh, ended up with a very successful heart transplant and I'm doing pretty well. So um, the next thing I'd like to do is just to, uh, our, my uh, co-host, Dawn Laney, uh, she doesn't need much of an introduction to most of you because everyone knows her, everyone knows Dawn. And uh, Dawn, I won't um, read her entire bio, but I'll, I'll read you. So our bios and, and speaker photos are up on the registration website in the tab for speakers and bios, but I'm gonna read you just a, a few things so I don't miss important things. So, um, so as you know, Dawn is at Emory and she has a huge, tremendous task at Emory doing lots of things. And she also supports the National Fabric Disease Foundation with things like this. So Dawn is my co-host and Dawn manages the, uh, the technical things where either my vision or my hearing fail me. So when you ask questions, Dawn will take care of all that, all that part. But of course, Dawn's a genetic counselor She's an assistant professor, a clinical researcher who has published lots of papers or contributed to lots of papers. And she is the clinical research program leader, leader at uh, the Lysosomal Storage Disease Center and director of the Genetic Clinical Trials Center in uh, the Department of Human Genetics at Emory in Atlanta. And so Dawn's done tons of things, so read her bio in addition to several um, kids books, which you can see most of them on our website in the featured resources section. So I don't uh, want to keep you much. Let me just look at my note really quickly. Um, oh, so have your cameras um, with you, if you, or I hope you have your cameras with you, because you give me an opportunity later to take a photo of a couple of announcements that I'm going to make. These are going to be recorded. You'll be able to see those later, but may take us a week or, or more. And who knows what go, might go wrong. So take photos of the announcements um, that I provide you later so you'll have those on record. All right, with that, I'm gonna hand you over to Dawn. She's going to introduce uh, Dr. Jeffries and say a couple other things. Thank you, Dawn, welcome. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks everybody for joining in. I'm really excited that we've got so many people who are willing to give up some of their evening to learn more about Fabry disease in the heart. Um, I'm very excited also to say we're going to have a prize drawing at the end of this session. So watch for our prize drawing code at the very end. Um, I'm going to put it in the chat so you'll be able to see it and we'll also say it as well. And then they'll do a drawing and we'll let you know who the winner was. Um, also, uh, really, when we talk about Dr. John Jeffries, he doesn't need any introduction at all. He's been dedicated to Fabry disease and the heart and genetic conditions that affect the heart for many years now. Uh, his work at Cincinnati made him really well known in his close partnerships uh, with the genetics department there and Dr. Rob Hopkins. And now he's continuing that amazing work down at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, where he's the uh, J.M. Sullivan Endowed Chair in Cardiovascular Medicine, and he's the Chief of Cardiology, and he's the co-director of the University of Tennessee Methodist Institute of Cardiovascular Science. So he's got a lot of hats he's wearing, and we're really honored to have him here with us today to tell us more about uh, the heart and Fabry disease. Thank you, Dawn, and good evening, everyone. It's great to see you. Let me see if I can share my screen here. Um, and we will get started. All right, 
Um, Dr. Jeffries, I meant to ask you, do you want questions throughout or do you want me to gather all the questions at the end and ask you then? Um, maybe towards the end, Dawn, if, if that's okay with you. Sure. Yeah. If everybody, you could put your questions in the chat, then I'll keep track of them and then we can ask Dr. Jeffries them at the end. We may have some overlapping questions. It's an opportunity Absolutely. to answer them all. Thank you. Can you all see my screen? Can you, can you see the slides? Yes. Yeah. Great. Yes, we can. Very good. It's really good. All right. Well, thank you again um, for the opportunity. And this is not meant to be an all encompassing talk. Uh, heart failure is a huge topic. Um, but this will at least give everyone a, a bit of a sense of what we try and assess in Fabre and the things we're worried about. And obviously, more than happy to have offline discussions about all this uh, at your uh, convenience. So, these are some of the things that we look for um, in Fabry disease. And, and you've heard a lot of these things through different talks or through your providers. And you know, one of the biggest things we pay attention to is high blood pressure, what we would call systemic hypertension. But we also uh, pay a lot of attention to a thickening of the heart. So this business called left ventricular hypertrophy. And it truly is that, is that the heart muscle just get thick. Um, and sometimes people will call it the heart is enlarged, but it really is a thickening of the heart muscle. And we'll show you some pictures of that in a few minutes. We do worry about rhythm problems, some slow, some fast. Uh, some people require pacemakers, some people require defibrillators. Um, we worry about valvular disease where the valves can be a little too leaky or even become what's called stenotic or a little too restrictive, usually on the left side of the heart. You can have problems with the vasculature and specifically things like the aorta, the big artery that leaves your heart can become dilated. So that's something we pay attention to. We know that Fabry patients are at risk for earlier uh, evidence of ischemic heart disease and that's just a fancy phrase for heart attacks. So that's something that we uh, are very cognizant of. And all of these things can lead to sudden cardiac death which obviously is something we try and avoid. But if you look at all of these in total, uh, a lot of them really sum up in the direction of heart failure. And heart failure sounds ominous, and it is in some ways. Heart failure purely means the inability of your heart to deliver enough oxygen to the tissues. That's what heart failure is. But there are different types of heart failure. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So these are some of the things that we see in Fabre and they kind of lead into everything that we were just talking about. So we know the heart muscle can become thick, both the cells themselves. So the heart itself is not just a bunch of muscle. Um, you have muscle cells, which are called cardiomyocytes and around those are kind of a lattice, basically like a frame of a house. And then you put all the stuff on, on it, like your shingles and stuff or the heart muscle cells that can actually expand to, that's called the extracellular matrix, which is the ECM. We know the inside of the blood vessels, the endothelium can behave abnormally. So let's say, you know, if you stand up, your blood vessels are supposed to constrict to pump more blood to your head. But in some people, there's a dysregulation of that and we call it dysautonomia in some people or vasomotor insufficiency. And it basically means is that as opposed to constricting, the blood vessels will dilate and that's where people can sometimes get dizzy or even pass out. And then when, as we talked about, the valves can become a little bit dysfunctional as well. So all these things can be going on in parallel and they can all lead to heart failure or the inability of the heart really to deliver the way that it's supposed to. So these are the things that we see. And, and as we just, we talked about all of these, but the main takeaway uh, is a very simple one, is that you don't want any of these. You want to avoid these, right? So we want to avoid heart failure. We want to avoid that heart attack. We want to avoid a stroke. Once you have those things in specific to, let's say, a heart attack, once you damage that heart muscle, it's dead and it's not coming back, at least in the current era. Heart failure is similar. Um, once you have enough symptoms to be admitted with heart failure, that gives you a rough prediction of about a 50% mortality in five years from one hospital admission. 
And it actually gets worse if you get hospitalized more and more and more. So our big goal with heart failure typically is to control or, or mitigate symptoms. So the shortness of breath and all that sort of business, but then to keep people out of the hospital. Those are two big goals that we try and strive for. So we know um, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of mortality in Fabre, and it's a big driver of morbidity as well, meaning just illness and hospitalizations. And we know a lot of people have some sort of, you know, uh, preceding symptomatology perhaps, but not always. And so you have to be relatively agnostic about how you look at patients with Fabre and approach them as an individual patient and recognize that they can manifest with one, two, none, all of these different things that we've been talking about. So when you talk about cardiovascular care and Fabre, to me, it's pretty uh, straightforward. We wanna prevent these conditions if we can. And usually that's by early detection. And we'll talk just a little bit about that, but what we're mostly gonna talk about is if you do have heart failure, what do we need to do or what can we do? Um, and we know there aren't really lots and lots of data sets out there telling about how to predict what's gonna happen in the future. So, um, and as I said, and once you have one of these events, it really, you're kinda, you've, you've let the horse out of the barn in some ways and we don't want that to happen. So what we do, um, and I think a lot of centers that are Fabre centers, um, you know, places like Emory, you've been hearing from Dawn, is that we try and be aggressive about surveillance, whether that's kidney, whether that's heart, whatever, because we want to we wanna get a snapshot of how things are at baseline, but then we also want to be able to detect a change. And if there's a change, we want to be able to intervene on that, obviously. And I put this slide in just because I think it really um, kind of uh, undersells the importance of cardiovascular disease in Fabre. So you can see here talking about cardiovascular events and they kind of start, you know, kind of mildly supposedly when you're less than 25. But I'll tell you after doing this for a while is that there are a lot of events going on and people just don't know it. Okay. And how are you gonna know about an event if you don't hear about it or you don't diagnose it, such as an arrhythmia or unusual heartbeat? So I think that actually this, this schema, these graphs actually should be shifted to the left. I think it's earlier. I think there are more people having symptoms. And if you're having symptoms, that tells you that there's something significant going on typically. And so, just as a, a kind of a, a prelude or, or an understanding of how we talk about cardiovascular disease as cardiologists as a community, so the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, this is how we um, put out recommendations for how we care for patients, okay? And it's color-coded to make it a little bit easier to understand, but basically what it means is that on the left, is that strength of recommendations, do we think it's really gonna make a difference in a good way? So the benefit outweighs the risk by a lot. And then you go down, 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 and there actually are interventions that can actually be worse, um, that can make patients worse. And so those are the ones that are class three, we say we don't do these sorts of things, right? And then on the right is really about how much information do we have to support this statement? And you can imagine in something like Fabre, it's hard because there aren't millions and millions of patients out there that we can study. You know, for heart attacks or strokes, there are, you know, there's just a heart attack every 40 seconds in the United States. So there's a lot of opportunities to study these sorts of things. But this is kind of how we put out that information. And, and when you look at these things, it'll give you kind of a, a barometer, if you will, about what it all means. So when we talk about heart failure, I told you, it really means is that blood can't get to the tissues and the tissues can't function appropriately. And in Fabre, let's say that's an important one like the kidney, right? So heart failure can be broken down into different sort of subsets. And many of you probably have had some sort of cardiac imaging where you've had an echo or an MRI or something, and they tell you what your ejection fraction is. Where your ejection fraction kind of helps us to define what kind of heart failure we're talking about. 
So classically, less than 40% is what's called heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, or in, in my world, we call it HEFREF, right? Because we're too lazy, I guess, to say the whole thing. And then there's the greater than 50%, which is called HEFPEF. And that means that the squeeze part is preserved, okay? The problem is, is that remember in a cardiac cycle, you know, lub dub, lub dub, you have a squeeze, so that ejects blood out of the heart, and that's what that ejection fraction is telling you. But then the heart has to relax, so it has to relax to let blood to come in to squeeze out again, right? So that's called diastole, so a squeeze is systole, relaxation is diastole. And both are energy dependent, so they require a lot of energy, both to squeeze, relax, squeeze to relax. And the problem is some people have obvious problems with the way the heart squeezes, but some people actually have problems with the way the heart relaxes. And the people that have the heart relaxation problems are those HEFPEF. So those are the people, squeeze is still good, relaxation is abnormal. And then we have other ones that kind of fall in between, between 40 and 50, and those are kind of borderline patients. And Fabre, I'm pretty aggressive. I treat those just like they have an ejection fraction less than 40, because I know it's only going to progress over time. But that at least gives you the two sort of big buckets, if you will, of heart failure, half ref, half pep, reduced squeeze, normal squeeze, relaxation problems, okay? And so this is how we talk about patients. It doesn't matter what the etiology is. It could be from a heart attack. It could be from Fabre. It could be from cancer therapy, whatever. This is how we categorize patients. And stage A is on the left, and that means you're at risk. And by definition, anyone with Fabre is at risk. So everyone with Fabre is a stage A, period. Now, they may be more than that, but at least they are a stage A, okay? Stage B is when you actually start having trouble either with the squeeze or the relaxation, but you don't have any symptoms from it, okay? And then it gets worse as you move to the right. So you have stage C means you have the squeeze or relaxation problem, and now you have symptoms because of it. And then last is stage D, which is a tough place to be, which is where you have heart failure symptoms that we just can't mitigate. They can either be with activity or at rest. Okay, and that's when we're really talking about more advanced therapeutics. But you can see at the bottom what we try and do for all of these things. So we're trying in those at risk patients to treat anything that might make things worse. So obesity, diabetes, blood pressure, all that kind of stuff. But then when we start seeing some of these other problems where there's actually a, a measurable problem with squeeze or relaxation, we'll talk about drug therapy. And some of these you may have heard about. Not necessarily is the way they're listed here, but things like ACE inhibitors or lisinopril, ramipril, um, and then uh, angiotensin receptor boxers or ARBs or like losartan, valsartan, uh, candesartan, and then beta blockers are like metoprolol, carvedilol. Those are the common ones that we use. But you can see those lists get a little bit bigger as you move to the right. And then when you get to stage D, we're really in an important spot because that's when we're talking about the big time sort of therapies, such as a thing called a left ventricular cyst device or a mechanical pump to help your heart, or even a transplant. And so obviously we try and avoid stage D if we can. And this is really kind of what's going on, is that up at the top, you see, um, you see a normal heart is on the left. I don't know if you can see my arrow, but then you go, then it becomes let's say it kind of thickens, for example, and this would be in the setting of a heart attack where you damage heart muscle. And then that part of the heart muscle actually thins out. Well, you can see this looks very different than this. This looks more like a basketball, okay? This is kind of what we worry about with Fabre, where you have a normal heart and then it gets thick. This is the left ventricular hypertrophy. And that's that relaxation problem I was talking about tight muscles don't relax very well. So if you've ever done bicep curls, you feel your muscles be tight. That's what we're talking about. But some of those patients can actually progress to this sort of basketball shaped problem where it actually is an issue, not just with relaxation anymore, but with squeeze problems. And that's usually about 10% of people that have this kind of heart disease, the thick heart muscle. And I don't know if these will play, 
but so on the left is a normal normal heart okay so kind of cool i don't know if you've ever seen an, an echo um but uh this is the pumping chamber we're paying attention to this is the left ventricle okay but look at this one how much thicker this is that same chamber but look how much thicker this wall septum and compared to this one to this one it's about twice or maybe two and a half times as thick and interestingly if you look closely you see kind of a an echo uh sort of opaque thing here that's actually a defibrillator lead so this patient actually has an implantable defibrillator which is going into the right ventricle or the right sided pumping chamber and let's say we look at the heart in a cross section. So we cut it across on the left, this is normal. So this is your donut of reference, if you will, okay? This is abnormal. And you can see that from across the room, right? You know, I mean, that's obviously probably three times the normal thickness. This is extreme left ventricular hypertrophy. This would be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, okay? And you can imagine, you know, that a heart like that's just not going to squeeze very well. I mean, you know, it's going to it actually going to squeeze exceptionally well, but it's not going to relax very well because it's just so muscular. And then when we talk about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or, you know, this sort of variant of this disease, there are different subsets of that. So one is called obstructive and one is non-obstructive. And I'll show you kind of what I mean is that this is a normal heart. So blood comes into the heart, it goes down here kind of to the tip, and then it goes out this big tube, which is the aorta, okay? This is a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where blood can still get out. So that's non-obstructive. Big heart, but blood can still move out okay, okay? Here's obstructive though, where you actually have this big roadblock, if you will, and where blood can't get out over the heart very well, so as opposed to being nice and smooth, like a, the middle of a stream, it has a bunch of eddies in it and it can't really get over this big hump very easily. That's called obstructive HCM. And the treatments that we offer for those are a little bit different. And these people with obstruction oftentimes have symptoms. So that's something that we pay close attention to. And then the last thing that we kind of look at from an, just from a heart failure perspective is how normal is the heart muscle, okay? And this is where we use things like cardiac MRI. And this is that same donut that I showed you on the ultrasound, the echo, but we've given a contrast agent called gadolinium. And a normal heart should be all black like this, okay? Here we see a big white crescent in there, okay? And so this is that cross of the heart. This is the heart in a long axis same crescent there. That actually indicates scar tissue, okay? So that means we've replaced normal black, sort of quote unquote, normal myocardium with scar or fibrosis. Well, a couple of things about scar. One, it doesn't squeeze, right? So you've automatically done yourself a disservice from the squeezing possibility. Two, it makes it harder for the heart to relax. So that relaxation automatically becomes impaired. And then thirdly, this actually sets you up for the bad heart rhythm. So things like ventricular tachycardia. So something that we would like to avoid if we can. And this is just this idea that, you know, I think if you're talking to your practitioners, um, uh, your providers, and, and they may tell you there's some, there are a lot of misconceptions about cardiovascular disease, but one is, is that you can't develop that scar tissue that I just showed you unless your heart muscle is thick. And that's not true. Um, actually, probably the earliest things that we see are the development of that scar tissue, even before your heart muscle gets thick. And that's why we advocate getting the MRI instead of the echo, because the MRI gives us that early information that that ultrasound picture just doesn't give us. Another thing that kind of indicates heart failure in Fabry patients is exercise capacity. And this is true of everyone. And this is a prognosticator we use to to, to assess when people might need a transplant, for example. And it's a thing called a cardiopulmonary exercise test where you get on a treadmill, we have you breathe through a tube, and we're basically measuring how well your end organs, like your muscles, are using oxygen. And that's what that VO2 is you see highlighted here. And it basically tells us that 
even at baseline, Fabry patients have impaired exercise tolerance, okay? In the face, I'm not in the face of those massive thick hearts or anything else, just tells you that at a cellular level, things don't work the way that they should. And it kind of makes sense. There's a genetic trigger here that's gonna be uh, expressed in every cell in the body. So this already tells you that you're a little bit of a setup for um, the inability to use oxygen appropriately. So I was telling you, you gotta deliver oxygen and you gotta use oxygen. And so we know even in the absence of some of those pump abnormalities at the tissue level, it's a problem. So you have to think about all of that kind of globally. And so I'm gonna give you just some basic examples of what we do, or these are the guidelines we would suggest for people that have this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And just to be clear for everyone, in, in cardiology terms, what we see in Fabry is what's called an HCM phenocopy. So that means it looks like what we would consider classic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but it's really just a difference in the genetics and the mechanism. And I don't want you to get too bogged down with that. But what we're saying is that we use these guidelines. Uh, we, trend, we align these guidelines in Fabray because we really don't have specific guidelines for Fabray per se, but these are very applicable. And this is how we would manage someone with heart disease in Fabray. And so, we, you know, a couple of things when we're looking through the slides is we want to make sure that we don't see that obstructive word, right? Because I said the management is a little bit different between the non-obstructive and the obstructive. And these are some things that you can counsel your providers on that will be very helpful. So one is that we avoid certain kinds of drugs. We don't want to drop the blood pressure too much, okay? So there are certain drugs that specifically work on the arteries to, to dilate them. And those are drugs like calcium channel blockers. Um, this phosphodiesterase inhibitor is the most common one you may have heard about would be something like Viagra, for example. So sildenafil, tadalafil. But any of those, and then other drugs like nitrates, so like nitroglycerin, isosorbide dinitrate, all those drugs can actually open up the blood vessels too much and actually cause that speed bump or that gradient to occur. So we're very careful. The management of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is relatively straightforward. We don't want to get too much fluid out of the tank. So there has to be enough sort of volume, if you will, intravascularly to fill the heart because the relaxation is not normal to begin with. So we want to get as much fluid as we can in there. The other thing is we don't want to drop the blood pressure on the other side of the heart too low. Those are the two basic tenets of the management of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And so if your drug, if your doctor has you on something like amlodipine or a lot of a diuretic like Lasix, those are not good therapies for you. And you should look into seeing about getting those adjusted. Those are common therapies for blood pressure management, but we don't like to use those therapies in the setting of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, okay? These are more of those things we were talking about um, that we would try and do to help people avoid symptoms. And so these are the, some of the drugs that you might see used, or you may be taking them yourself if you have the obstructive form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. They're beta blockers, verapamil, which is a calcium channel blocker, and then disapiramide, which is actually an antiarrhythmic drug. And all of these actually work. And mechanistically, what we're trying to do is to slow the heart rate down because once again, we got that stiff balloon and we're trying to get fluid in there, right? Well, I wanna give the heart as much time to pump fluid into that balloon as I possibly can. And that's what these drugs do is they slow the heart rate. So that's the purpose of these drugs, okay? And then, um, as I said, you know, there's some things that we try and avoid, right? And so we were talking about the diuretics, we try and avoid some of those sorts of things. And there are certain things that you just have to be really careful with if you give intravenously, for example, like beta blockers. So, and these are all online. You can go onto the American College of Cardiology website, American Heart Association, and you can find these things. But it's impressive to me. Um, you know, I've been doing this a little while now, but I interact with a lot of cardiologists across the globe. How many people don't really know what we're telling you? Um, as far as the management of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Most people 
including cardiologists are quite afraid of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because it's a trigger for sudden death, right? When you, we're talking about for Fabre, but when you see someone die on a football field, a soccer pitch, this is the disease that they most likely have. So people don't really understand the pathophysiology and the hemodynamics and those things as well as they possibly could. And so I think anything you can take away from this would probably be helpful from your self-advocacy perspective. The other thing I wanted to mention though, is remember I said a few patients that have the thick relax problem go to a dilated squeeze problem, right? So they go from what's called a hypertrophic phenotype to a dilated phenotype. And that just means that the heart is opposed to being conical like a football, looks more like a basketball. It doesn't squeeze very well and it's big and boggy. And that's something that we don't want, obviously. And so there are some things that we try and do um, both in the preserved and then in those people that have the reduced squeeze. But these are things that we would try and do pretty much universally for heart failure. And one of those is to control blood pressure, okay? So if you think about someone who has a big, thick heart muscle, it's a pump, right? Well, it's pumping against the pressure. That's what the pump is for. It's generating pressure in your bloodstream. So if I elevate that pressure, what's going to happen? So if I put weights on the end of that dumbbell I'm lifting, what happens? My heart, my, hopefully my arm gets bigger, right? Well, the same thing happens with your heart. If it is pumping against a high resistance or a high pressure, the natural response is it for it to get thicker. Well, we already have a thick heart. We don't want it to get thicker than what it already is, right? So that's an important component is to manage blood vessel. And then these are some other things that should always be considered. Um, and we're starting to see pretty commonly uh, that Fabry patients seem to be predisposed to atrial fibrillation, okay? And we know this happens in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in general, probably about 25, 30% of the time at least. And so the problem is, is if you, atrial fibrillation just means that the top chambers of the heart are kind of quivering and they're not squeezing very well. Well, once again, I'm relying on this top chamber to squeeze blood into this thick, kind of tight um, uh, ventricle that doesn't relax very well. I need that top chamber to work as effectively as possible. And that's called sinus rhythm, okay? And that's why we try and manage atrial fibrillation pretty aggressively in this disease, meaning things like blood thinners, but also trying to keep your heart in a normal rhythm. So those are things that we would pay close attention to. And then um, just a few other things. These are things that we can use that you can take away is just about, are there other drug therapies? And we won't spend too much time on this. Like I say, you can find it uh, on, online, but it gives you some ideas about other potential things we need to pay attention to like kidney function, as you can see here. And then these are the ones that we tell you, like you got to tell your doctor or the people in the ER or whomever, do not do this, okay? And that's those phosphodesterase inhibitors that I was talking about, like Cialis or like Viagra and some of these other drugs. You have to be really, 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 really careful. And then there are no recognized nutritional supplements unless you are deficient in something that make a difference, right? So taking um, iron, if your iron levels are normal, are not going to help. Uh, taking CoQ10 is probably not going to help if your levels are normal. So those are things that you want to take away. One of the big ones we push in cardiology now is vitamin D, regardless of the condition. But we would only want you to take vitamin D if you are deficient, right? Because too much vitamin D can actually be toxic. So those are things to keep in mind. But now this comes back to those people that where the heart squeeze is going down. Okay, so the relaxation is bad, but now the squeeze is going down too. And these are more traditional therapies um, that you might see uh, in people that you know that have had heart failure in the past. And the point is a simple one is that the management of that squeeze kind of heart uh, problem is different than the people with the relaxation problem. Okay. And so when you start seeing that ejection fraction go down, the way that the uh, provider is managing you should be different, okay? 
And then these are things that I find the more I do this, it's exceedingly common is sleep apnea. And we're, I'm seeing a lot in my Fabre patients. I see it in most of my hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients. And so one thing that I do for pretty much everyone is we screen them for sleep apnea. And there's just a simple questionnaire that you can take. But if there's any indicator on there, I send people for a sleep study because sleep apnea is a big deal. Uh, it causes your blood pressure to go up. It causes heart muscle problems. It can cause pulmonary hypertension. All, not to mention your quality of life stinks if you're not sleeping very well. So all these things are important. So if you, if you uh, have not talked to your provider about the possibility of obstructive sleep apnea, you should, or even go online, there are simple quizzes or questionnaires that you can take to see if maybe you are at risk. So when we talk about um, things like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and heart failure, there are kind of, there are some big things, you know, one is that we want to improve symptoms as much as possible. But the biggest concern that we typically face in things like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or in a phenocopy is the risk of sudden death. And so, like I told you, you know, the people that you see dying on basketball courts, soccer fields, football, all that kind of stuff between 16 and 25, that is almost always hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So the question is, well, how could we avoid that, right? We don't want people to die of sudden death. And it's impossible to anticipate when that's gonna happen. I mean, no one has that kind of, you know, sort of forward thinking in their minds. But these are some of the things that we look for. And if you have that thick heart muscle, these are things you might wanna to speak to your provider about if they have not talked to you about how we do a thing called risk stratification for sudden death. And these are some of the things we would look at, things like if you've passed out in the last six months or so for no apparent reason, if we do Holter monitor, so rhythm monitoring, and we see this thing called non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, if your heart is extremely thick, meaning more than three centimeters, all these things we put into sort of an algorithm to decide who's at risk and who's not. And is it enough of a risk where I want to put a device in there to be a safety net, right? And that's the defibrillator. That's an implantable cardiovascular defibrillator, which lives under the skin, but will shock your heart out of bad heart rhythms. That's probably the paramount piece of management as far as I'm concerned when it comes to Fabry and heart disease is the avoidance of the avoidable, which is sudden death. We don't want that to happen. And these are things that, once again, that we can talk about and you can look at uh, at your leisure, but it really is about how can we determine um, who's at risk for sudden death. This is an important one because we know um, there are some people, and we have data now that, you know, on that MRI I was showing you that crescent thing, the white damage. Well, if you have enough of that stuff, that can be an independent risk for sudden death. And so that's where the importance of cardiac MRI can come into play. And then these are the ways that we would approach this, right? If we thought you were at risk, we wouldn't let you play competitive sports, but we would talk to you about a thing like a defibrillator. And this is actually a way to kind of calculate it. And like I say, you can go online and figure these things out if you want. There are algorithms to do this. And basically it's about what is your risk over the next few years of actually having an arrest? And, you know, low, and by, this is Perry Elliott from the UK, they said less than 4%. I would say I'd like it to be zero personally for low risk, but I mean, you know, you have to stratify these things. Then intermediate risk, meaning you have some of those risk factors, and sometimes that's a personal decision. Do you want some sort of a shock device therapy or not? And then those people at high risk, are we going to universally recommend that they get the ICD? And that's usually when we see two of those risk factors. One is typically kind of the intermediate, but when you have two, almost everyone's going to say, we probably need to think about doing this. And this is one of those risk calculators I was telling you about. So if you want to try it out, you can go online and actually do it. And these things exist and, and you can get an idea of what your risk is and you can talk to your provider. And then these are some of the surgical interventions that we can offer uh, for people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So remember I was showing you the speed bump. 
sometimes we can give medicines, but it's not enough to alleviate the speed bump. So blood still can't get out. So it's called obstruction with symptoms, okay? And sometimes we say, well, you know, it's really impairing people's quality of life. So they can't do what they need to do. We can actually go in there and shave off that speed bump. And, and that's called a myectomy. Um, and people can actually go in with a scalpel and cut down some of that heart muscle. Um, we, we try and avoid that, obviously, if we can. Um, but there are some patients where it's necessary. And it's amazing for people that have that, once they have the surgery, they tend to, to do feel a lot better. The only caveat is, is that you need to be on the maximal amount of medications you can tolerate, see if you can avoid the symptoms. Uh, and the second thing is if you're gonna get it done, make sure you're in the hands of someone who does this routinely, right? This is not a common surgery in your community hospital, I promise you. So just something to think about. And then we get to that stage D I was telling you about. So we've tried everything. We've given medicines, we have the defibrillator, we tried the myectomy and we still just aren't doing very well. And this is really more for those people that we see in that vein where the, the heart muscle was thick and not relaxing, but now is really deteriorated where it, where it doesn't squeeze very well either. So it's more of that, what's called a HEFREF kind of a phenotype. And this is the idea of mechanical circulatory support, okay? And basically is truly what it means is that a pump takes over the work of your heart, the left side. And it's, it's a, an electric pump and you can see a battery here and then a shoulder uh, holster there. But this little thing kind of inserts in the tip of your heart or the apex and it sucks blood out goes through this tube and pumps it back into the aorta or that big tube leaving the heart. So it basically unloads, it sucks the blood out so this chamber doesn't have to work as hard anymore, okay? This particular device, these are called continuous flow devices, so they're rotary. So they basically continue to circulate blood continuously. Um, the thing about that is, is that if you have one of these, you don't have a pulse typically depending on how quickly the device is moving, how many uh, revolutions it's making. But these devices have revolutionized how we manage heart failure because over the last 20, maybe 30 years now, the number of heart transplants performed worldwide has not changed. And that's around 36, 3,700 people. Well, I'm telling you, there are just in the US about 6 million people with heart failure, probably around 28 million worldwide. And some of those are gonna need this sort of stage D therapy. Well, we don't have any more hearts. We don't grow them on trees. So what are we gonna do? And the way that we do it is through these mechanical devices. And a couple of years ago was the first year that we put in more of these devices than we did heart transplants. Um, some people, and this is a long discussion, would be another lecture that we could do, but there are a couple of ways to use these therapies. One is what's called a bridge to transplant, where we put it in so you stay out of the hospital, keep your symptoms in check until you get a heart, or they're called uh, a destination therapy, where it means this is your transplant equivalent, okay? You're going to have this device for the rest of your life. Good news is these devices are predicted to at least last 50 years, the current generation. So, um, and so in some ways you actually may fare better longevity wise than some of the transplant patients. So it's just something to keep in mind. There are pluses and minuses to both strategies. Um, you know, currently, obviously, if you have a VAD, you're living with a thing coming out of your belly, basically, which is your drive line. Um, the next generation of these devices will actually be fully implantable, meaning the battery and everything else will all be in the chest cavity. And then you would charge them sort of transcutaneously, just like you do a phone, essentially pretty amazing. But that's kind of where we're moving with this sort of technology. And then obviously transplant is something that we can think about. And transplant has been around a long time. Uh, you know, where I did my training, my mentor was um, one of the people did the first heart transplants and, um, but it's a, it's a serious thing to take on obviously, but the good news is, is that you can keep people out of the hospital and give them your quality of life back, all those sorts of things. Um, but you also have a quality of life change because you're taking a lot of medicines and all those other sorts of things. So remember that transplant and VAD are not a cure, 
but they really do change the trajectory of your disease, can give you a very normal lifespan in a lot of conditions, and most importantly, allow you to do what you want to do. And this is kind of just a quick algorithm about how we treat that heart squeeze problem short of doing the VAD and the transplant. So these are the medical therapies that we would offer. And these may not make sense to you, some of these little abbreviations, but there are drugs that you've heard about. And um, the most frequent one to know about now is this idea of what's called Secubitril. It's actually a drug called Secubitril Valsartan. If you watch TV at all, you've seen ads for Entresto. That's what this medicine is. And it's sort of the revolutionary therapy for heart failure and the oral forms. But these are things you can look at over time to make sure that people are giving you the right kind of therapy. And these are, you know, these are uh, different kinds of populations. For example, we have a special drug called Vidil that we use in African-American populations, for example but this is something that you can look at that might give you a little bit of insight. And as I said, you know, honestly, treating the comorbidities is one of the biggest things that you can do. So making sure your blood pressure is okay. If you're anemic, making sure your blood counts are okay and then treating obstructive sleep apnea. But one thing that I tell all my patients is that you can't forget about common stuff, right? So common things are common. So just because you have Fabre doesn't mean you're immune to having a heart attack from cholesterol problems or having diabetes or anything else. So this is way more frequent than Fabre and you can very, very much have comorbidities that affect your heart with Fabre independent of any kind of storage problems or anything else. And so I would um, tell you when you think about yourself or your family, Think about these things and these apply, these things I'm saying now apply to all of us. And I, I'll tell you, I fail at a lot of this too. So one is just a healthy lifestyle, right? Sort of common sense. Second is having enough people looking at you that they know to look for these things, manage your blood pressure, make sure you're not developing diabetes, make sure you're active, make sure your BMI is good. And everyone pretty much in the adult age range should look at what their risk factors are for atherosclerotic disease, so blockages in your coronaries. And there's a simple calculator that you can go and do your risk factors for that as well. And that is the one that tells you typically, do I need to modify my diet? Biggest one is, do I need to go on a statin? So something like Crestor or Lipitor, or those sorts of drugs. And these calculators will tell you very specifically what your risk is and what we should be trying to do for you. Obviously consume a healthy diet as much as possible. Most people would suggest that's probably a Mediterranean diet, but things that avoid a lot of salt, uh, avoiding refined sugars, red meats, those are the things that most people would tell you to do. Um, physical activity. And, you know, we don't, none of us do enough of this typically. And the minimum suggested is 150 minutes a week of moderate activity. And you can go on the website and see what moderate means. That's usually like a brisk walk or something like that. Or 75 minutes of intense exercise, like singles tennis or something. That, and that's per week. And I would guess many people would not meet those thresholds. I don't, uh, even though I try. It's hard. 150 a week is a lot. If you have diabetes, take care of it. Don't smoke. And if you can avoid it, Treat your cholesterol if it's an issue. And like I said, that's usually gonna be in the form of statins or other drugs out there like Zetia, which are absorption changers. And then there are new drugs that are injectables called PCSK9s that are very important in the way we manage uh, lipid problems. And then what can you do for non-medical therapies for hypertension? Stay active, don't become obese, all those usual sorts of things, right? Don't ingest, you know, 20 bags of Doritos a day with a lot of salt. So all that kind of stuff is something to take away. The things that are exciting, I know a lot of this sounds really serious and it is, um, but I'll tell you in the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy space and in that hef hef space, place where the heart muscle is thick and it doesn't relax very well, we really haven't had any medical therapies that make a difference. 
and that's kind of sad to say for as long as we've known about these diseases, but they're really complex to treat. So a couple of big breakthroughs that have happened recently. So one is a drug called Mavicamptin. And really what that drug does is help the heart relax. And it's a, it, there's a, basically it works at the, what's called the sarcomeric level where this little ratchet mechanism of how the muscles contract is sort of inhibited. And so basically you, we can use this drug. Now this is in, not in Fabre, this is in other types of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but basically where the heart will relax more, not squeeze as hard and improve people's symptoms. So help them to do more of what they want to do therapy. And um, I think it'll probably get FDA approved probably in the next few weeks, actually. And then this was probably, this just came out this week, I think, or maybe last, is that that drug in Tresto I was telling you about um, now has an indication for the heart relaxation problem, the HEFPA. Classically, it was only indicated for people with a squeeze problem and your ejection fraction had to be less than 40%. Now we're saying we can use it in other people, regardless of their heart failure sort of uh, silo, right? And that's a pretty big deal because up till now, we have had zero drugs that are actually effective on this type of heart disease, zero. So that's a big deal and something that I think to, in my mind, we could potentially translate into the Fabre space relatively easily. So just to conclude, you know, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it's complicated. It's not just a thick heart muscle. There's a lot of stuff going on. Um, and I personally, I guess I'm, I'm biased, but we, I would strongly suggest you're managed with this kind of heart disease in a place that knows what it is. And that's, there are centers of excellence across the country that are familiar with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, even if they're only helping your local provider manage the disease, I would strongly suggest that you think about that. We do know that a lot of patients can progress to heart failure, either the re relax problem or the squeeze problem. We know, you know, biggest thing in my mind when you come to see me is that we want to make sure you're safe and that's where the stratification comes in. And then all these things that we talked about should potentially be considered. Um, to me, Fabre is a little more complex than just traditional hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because we're dealing with all the other organ systems that are involved, right? Most specifically, typically the kidneys. That really Im Im affects how we treat people and how quickly things can progress with heart disease. And so you really have to have someone who kind of understands this entire milieu. I tell you, heart failure, we see it more and more now as a big driver of problems in Fabre and it's something to take very seriously. And from our perspective, it's not a whole lot different than recognition and need for ERT. Early recognition, early therapy usually leads to a better outcome, okay? And so that's something I think everyone would want to be cognizant of is that if you're diagnosed with Fabre, you need to see a cardiologist and you need to be seeing, getting certain kinds of testing to make sure things are okay. And, you know, Jerry and everyone else can provide you with those sorts of checklists of things that should be being done for you. But I still think recognition is the key. And one is obviously diagnosing the disease, which is something we really need some help with in the United States. But then second is, okay, I got it. What do I need to watch out for? And I think we need to do a better, better job with that. But whatever we can do to avoid the symptoms and avoid coming into the hospital should be our target. Uh, I'm just telling you as a heart failure doc, that's what we try and do for pretty much everyone. These are, um, this is my contact information here. Um, please fill the two emails. Please feel free to reach out. If there's anything that I can do, I think a lot of people on the call actually have my cell phone, so I guess you can circulate that too. But um, so, and so with that, I uh, appreciate your, um, your time and uh, hopefully uh, you guys learned something out of that complicated topic, big, we could have a seven day conference on what we just talked about. So um, uh, hopefully that gave you some idea of what's going on, but thanks for your awesome. time. Happy to answer any questions. That's good because we have a good 25 questions. <laughs> so I categorize them kind of by grouping. So we can kind of take some from each grouping, kind of circle around if that works for you. Sure, sure. I think 
we kind of, the, the questions first started in arrhythmias and talking about conduction. So I'm going to start there and kind of move back around. Um, sure. There were some questions about atrial fibrillation and Fabry disease. Um, the first question, how do you tell if AFib is from Fabry disease versus another common cause? You probably really can't. Um, there are certain things that we know are directly tied to atrial fibrillation that are treatable. So things like hypothyroidism is a known cause of atrial fibrillation. If you had a TSH that was high, we treated and your AFib went away, then I would know that's not from Fabre. But it's really not necessarily because of the cause, it's because of the substrate. So what happens with atrial fibrillation is basically is that those top chambers get big, they become dysfunctional, they get scar tissue in them. And it's uh, this business called electrical remodeling essentially but it's not really something that's unique to any one population. It's more of what's going on at the cellular level or the structural level. That being said, there are some isolated genetic triggers of AFib independent of Fabre, but we don't know a ton about that at this point. So, and I think what I would say is it probably doesn't really matter. You know, we really have to treat it either way. You're going to rate control, maybe anticoagulate, all that kind of stuff. So. That fits right really nicely. And someone said, when you have AFib and Febre, should you always be on blood thinners? Not necessarily. Now, if you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, absolutely. That is a class one indication for a systemic anticoagulation. And the way that you can kind of figure this out is if you have AFib, there's a thing called a CHADS2 VASC score. And it's another one of those calculators, you know, you can spend all, on, all night online figuring out your scores for things but it has to do with history of heart failure, your age, your sex, vascular disease. And that will give you what your risk, predicted risk is. And that actually demarcates for people with AFib independent of Fabry, whether they need a blood thinner or not. The good news is, is just like Entresto has been revolutionary, drugs like Eliquis and Xarelto have been revolutionary for AFib because then you don't have to do the INRs and all that other kind of stuff. Is there, a, this is me asking, is there a role for something more minor like an aspirin or something? That's a good question. Yeah, you know, we, the, most people would suggest it's either all or nothing. Uh, aspirin really hasn't been shown to make a big difference in outcomes for AFib. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, if you had some other reason like the cerebrovascular disease or something, there's absolutely no downside to doing it. But it really is, if you think about the mechanism, that's a platelet drug, and we're talk talking about a coagulation problem. So a um, little bit different stuff. And if you're going to do it, you need to treat it with the, these DOAC drugs, typically. Yeah. I know many people are on um, aspirin for stroke risk in general for Fabry. So it just kind of, you know, how do you set Absolutely. It? Yeah. And, but then, you know, if you really do go on to the blood thinner, then you just have to be careful, obviously, because then you have two reasons to bleed. So and just something to pay attention to. You kind of touched upon this one already, but how does Fabry affect the electrical induction system causing arrhythmias? Yeah, just like those cells can become disrupted, you know, with those lysosomes being, you know, fat and abnormal and squeezing and affecting capillary blood flow and all these other sorts of things. Same thing happens to those electrical cells in your heart. And so that can manifest as heart, the, the electrical activity being slow getting through the heart. And that's why some of our patients need pacemakers. Um, really what we see, and, and, and a lot of people on this uh, discussion know this, but the most common thing we see that's not really conduction, but it's early evidence is the bradycardia that we see in Fabre. We see it in um, pretty much everyone um, that um, is, uh, um, you know, even in adolescence sometimes. So we see a lot of people with fat, with uh, sinus bradycardia and that seems to persist throughout life. And that seems to be our earliest sort of EKG indicator, but it depends on what the electrical disruption is. Is it from the sinus node to the, what's called the AV node, or is it from the AV node out to the ventricles? And that manifests differently on an EKG and it portends very different treatments too. So. Um, this is a quick one. Does cardioversion damage the heart muscle? Not typically. You do get a little, you can get a little bit of a bump in these things called troponins when you do an electrical cardioversion, but it's way better than being an AFib, um, you know, long-term. The real 
a kicker, quote unquote, is, you know, how often do you need those cardioversions? Because that tells you you may need a more complex intervention for atrial fibrillation. Um, there's some, I'm switching to, oh, another real quick one. On EKG, why does it say ischemia when I don't have coronary artery disease and there's no evidence of coronary artery disease? Good for you. Yeah. So that's just what the machines have been taught to read out. So what they're looking at is that you'll develop, you could see on an EKG when heart muscle has been damaged. Okay. And they're called Q waves, but that's not specific to a heart attack. That's just what the machine spits out. Right. But that means that you probably have damage in that particular area of the heart. And if I did an MRI, you would have scar tissue there, mm -hmm. but you're right. It's not because of a blockage in the client. I'm going to kind of lump a bunch together here in the recommendation scheme. Um, if a cardiologist is an expert in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but not Fabry disease, uh, should it be treated the same? And if not, should how can someone reach out to an expert in Fabry disease and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Yeah, just take my email down and shoot me an email. Uh, there aren't, I mean, as a lot of folks on the, on the meeting know, there aren't a lot of experts in the cardiovascular realm for Fabry. Um, and I, I don't want to include myself in that conversation, but I can tell you there aren't, there aren't tons. And even for HCM, there aren't tons of experts. So I would say we are educating the HCM community. Um, we actually have a meeting coming up in September, October, that's devoted to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but does have Fabre as a part of the discussion. The, the good news is, is that most HCM centers are going to get genetic testing with that genetic testing, they're gonna identify Fabre. And I think, you know, that's where one, the patient can advocate. And you have to remember in the current era, you know, I see people from all over the world with Fabre. So you don't need to come to Memphis or go to Atlanta or whatever. I mean, you can do it virtually. And I think that that's one of the benefits of all this is that you can get assistance, you know, in the management of the Fabre. And the real reason to know about Fabre is because the therapeutic options are broader than traditional HCM. Yeah, that uh, leads pretty well into um, how, how well does enzyme replacement therapy work to slow down heart failure? What do the studies show? Yeah, we're starting to publish some data. Um, interestingly, we'll, we, we think we can probably stabilize some of the cardiac manifestations of Fabre and maybe even reverse some of these problems. Now, but you have to qualify that, right? If you, if you come to me and you have a lot of scar in your heart and it's like, is ERT going to fix this? The answer is no. Um, but can we potentially mitigate some of the ongoing inflammation, apoptosis, all those other sorts of things, I think that we can. Specific to heart failure, we don't really have any data. Um, most of what we've seen is more about a thing called LV mass, which is that thickness business. And one would think if it's thick and you want it thinner, that's a good thing. And we are seeing some favorable effects in that direction. And then some of the valve function we've seen improve uh, on ERT. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, monitoring. So there was two questions I'm going to lump together. One, well, three. One is how often should someone who's a kid or an adult with February see a cardiologist? And if they've had a full workup stress test, echo, EKG, what else could they do to find hidden results? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm ultra conservative uh, about these things. We're, you know, heart disease still kills more people than anything. So we, we were pretty careful about that. And so at a minimum, once a year is what I would typically recommend. I, you don't necessarily have to do that for a two-year-old, but that being said, adolescents, adulthood at a minimum once a year. And if I see evidence of heart disease, I'm probably at least looking at every six months. Um, aside from the things you just listed, um, and we have, there are other lectures that I, I think we'll probably provide over time, but I think a cardiac MRI should be performed to anyone who can tolerate it. Um, and I think more extensive rhythm surveillance should be pursued. So not just an EKG, at least a Holter monitor, which is typically about 72 hours and maybe even longer than that, especially if you're having symptoms of palpitations, I would be very aggressive. So most of the things we were talking about, the rhythm things are completely by chance. So you have to have a way to capture the rhythm to know what it is. And that there's a whole discussion about that. 
But then the MRI is, you know, the way I explain it to patients is, you know, a lot of the folks on the call are probably old enough like me to remember what a black and white TV looks like. Um, that's what echo is. And if you've ever watched one, that's truly what it is, right? Unless they put color Doppler on there. So MRI is like my 4K Samsung, you know, TV. Um, that's what MRI gives me. And so the ability to look at the heart muscle is unique to MRI. Echo does not give me that, right? So if you think about this, we want the earliest marker of a problem. And maybe that's your LISO GB3 levels. Maybe that's your serum creatinine or your kidney biopsy. Same thing for the heart. And it's, that's the MRI. And, and that's really what we advocate. Thank you. Um, how do you know, oh, this is two part. One part is how do you know it's time for a heart transplant or an LVAD? And why aren't so many February patients referred for heart transplant? Yeah, it's, um, so that's a, also another discussion. Um, but typically it's when we can ameliorate the symptoms, you know, when you have, so like when you're having those symptoms with mental activity or at rest, that's really when we need to start thinking about it. There are some discrete things that we can do, like the cardiopulmonary exercise test I was telling you about. Um, and there's a sort of a line in the sand that when we see it go below that number, we'll strongly consider transplant. I think the reason that it hasn't been used is that um, people maybe managing Fabry aren't aware of advanced heart failure therapies in a lot of ways. Um, and I think there's some thought that people with genetically triggered diseases can't be candidates for transplant, which is absolutely not the case. Um, one big consideration though in Fabre is if you have concomitant significant kidney disease, then that may restrict your ability to get a transplant, right? So if you have ESRD, it doesn't mean you can't get a transplant, but you may be looking at a heart kidney transplant or something like that. So um, I think it's awareness, um, you know, and, and you have to remember just those drugs we talked about, I think most people don't employ for Fabre much less talking about an LVAD or a transplant. So um, we're working on trying to improve uh, awareness, I think. And um, the point is, is that Fabry patients are no different than anyone else with heart failure. And those guidelines that I show you apply to Fabry just as much as anything else. Um, how many Fabry patients have dysautonomia or POTS? Oh gosh, great question. I have no idea. Don might know more than I do, but I, I don't know. You know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think a lot of people have it without being diagnosed for it. I couldn't agree more. I think it's like AFib. I think that's yeah. true. I, I think it, and that's a complex diagnosis. Um, so POTS and whatnot, you're talking about, you know, different types of testing and maybe tilt tables and other things. Um, and to be honest, it's not a condition you want. I mean, it's a hard thing to manage. Autonomic dysfunction is not easy, but we're starting to see it across the spectrum, whether it's Fabre. I see a lot of amyloidosis patients with, um, with, with the autonomic dysregulation and it's complicated because uh, there, there are a lot of subsets to that discussion. And that's also something that needs to be managed by a specialist typically. Um, I think you're right. I think it's kind of like lymphedema and a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. It just isn't characterized as well as we need to in February. Yeah, uh, we have more, but we've already kept you longer than we said we would. Um, the one thing we would ask is someone ask if you could put your email contact information in the, the chat. chat. And then some other folks who have their questions that weren't answered, they can directly contact you. Yeah, I'll put it in there as long as Jerry pays me a lot more money. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, this is where you get the big bucks. Thank you so much. I'm just kidding. It's there. So please feel free to shoot me an email. And, Wonderful. Uh, we Thank really you. do distant, you know, consults and whatnot. And, and if nothing else, I think a lot of the people on this discussion know folks geographically that can help, um, mm -hmm. you know. And it, but, you know, it, it's a big deal. And uh, it's a lot of it's just about quality of life and the assurance that you're doing okay. I mean, honestly, and avoiding those, those untoward outcomes. So happy to help any way that I can. Thank you. I appreciate your time tonight, and I appreciate all the questions you've answered. I know some people, we didn't get to all your questions, and if you can just, you can email them directly, email us at NFDF, and we'll forward it on as well, if you feel more comfortable. Absolutely. Take care, everyone. Stay Thank safe. you. Uh, time. Uh,
all the things that you, uh, how you support us. So thank you very much. Oh, you're very welcome. You know, I have a special place uh, for doing this and always available. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. So, um, um, we'll try. Special world. Do we want to give them the special word for attending, Jerry? Yeah, let me do this. Uh, let me get this. Let me get the announcements out. First. Absolutely. Go for it. So bear with us for just a couple of minutes. I'm going to um, share a screen with you. We're going to do the um, last part next, but we're going to do this part first. Huh. Just uh, pull this back up and put it on slideshow. Oh, I think I had to, or I had to do the screen share first. All right. Now, where is it? Sorry about this. This happens to me every time. Oh, here we go. All right. We have a couple of uh, slides, and this is where I uh, mentioned earlier, you might want to have your camera. So what this is, they're highlights from industry programs. So one of our jobs is to keep you informed of what's going on with, with the treatments and clinical trials and programs that the industry companies are providing. So here's a list of what they provided as their highlighted um, bullet for this meeting. So if you'd like to take a picture of that, now we're recording this meeting, so you'll see it in the recording, but that may take us a few days to a week or, or uh, to get it posted. So if you want to take a picture of this, you'll have these handy. Um, I'll give you a couple of seconds to do that. Otherwise, they'll be in the uh, recording. The next thing in, in along the same lines is, let me uh, go to the next slide. We put a... I can go to the next slide. Um, put it in slideshow. Yeah, you got it. The, at the top, the fourth one over with the, the little, yeah, that'll work too. There we go, sorry. Yep, both work. Okay. So we put a feature on our website. And if you go on the top menu bar of the website, and you'll see a tab that says pharma slash clinic information, you select that tab. And then you'll have a choice of going into pharma info, clinic info, or support organization info. If you collect, if you select any of those, it will give you boxes, big tabs of the organization. And if you open the read more window, you'll see all of the links that they resources they wanted to share. So, and we'll update that frequently. So, if you want to find something from one of the industry companies. You can go to those or one of the support companies. And I showed you examples below of the two kinds of things. But if you go on the bottom and you see the um, little read more button, select those. So it's just giving you some guys how to get there. I'll move on. We have about a thousand calendars yet to distribute. So if you've already subscribed to the newsletter, just send me an email making sure I have your current address and we'll get those out to you. If you're not already subscribed to the newsletter, and, this, and you can take a picture of this one. And at the bottom, it reminds you of how to subscribe to the newsletter. So that's that. And that's all I have. So um, I thought I had one more slide, but I don't see it. How much more? Huh. Feel I'm stuck again. One second. And the next thing is just not to be registered and watch for the registration links for the next 20 meetings that we're, uh, we already have scheduled or are working on it. So that's all I have. If Don, you'd like to do the uh, prize drawing, we're all set. Yeah. So I'll, I'll start out by just saying that the uh, prize word is heart. Um, so if everybody wants to just uh, put heart in the chat, then we'll go ahead and drive. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. You guys got it. You have your skills. And this one is reserved for primary attendees only. Correct. 
So I think almost everybody left from the call has done that. There's a benefit for staying on to the bitter ends tonight. <laughs> we'll refine the process. Yeah, yeah, we sure will. <laughs> yeah, I think almost everybody's got their heart in. Uh, Karen has a question. Let me bring the button. Let's see. Is there anyone left to put their code wood in? I think we've got them all. All right. I was just getting confirmation from the meeting organizers if we're going to draw now or we're going to draw later. No, hold on just one second. I'll throw these names in my generator and we'll see. It only Thank take a enough. second. Perfect. So while Brenda's doing that, <laughs> we put um, all of your names into the random number, we assign a number, we put them into a random number generator, it pops out a, an answer for us and look to see who that number belongs to. We should have drum rolls or Jeopardy music or something. We wait happily. Matt Smith, or is it Smith? Okay. Matt, you are the winner. Yay! We will send you a prize. Well, we should, uh, let's see if um, we can unmute Matt for a minute just to make sure he heard us, but that's okay. He'll yep, he did. He says I'll thank you in the out. questions. I'll he heard out. us. <laughs> Yay! Right. Thank you. Congratulations, Matt. Thank you all again for participating on uh, Registration. Some people may have had a little difficulty with registration this time. We'll um, refine that process because this was our first meeting of 21. So we'll try to smooth out the bumps and uh, please do the evaluation so that we can get your thoughts. Um, especially we may consider making the meetings a little bit longer to allow some more time for, for questions. So tell us what you think and we can uh, go from here. But I think we had a, a successful first meeting. Thank you all so That's much. Great. John, Thanks, dear. I was just going to say you're going to get the survey yield emailed to you. It'll be um, a survey monkey survey. So fill it out. Tell us what you think. All right. Thank you all. You Thanks, everybody. Night.